At last, the revenants became so troublesome, the peasants abandoned the village, and it fell solely into the possession of subtle and vindictive inhabitants, who manifest their presence by shadows that fall almost imperceptibly awry, to many shadows even at midday, shadows that have no source in anything visible, by the sound sometimes, of sobbing in a derelict bedroom, where a cracked mirror suspended from a wall does not reflect a presence, by a sense of unease that will afflict the traveler unwise enough to pause to drink from the fountain in the square that still gushes spring water from a faucet stuck in a stone lion's mouth. A cat prowls in a weedy garden. He grins and spits, arches his back, bounces away from an intangible on four fear-stiffened legs. Now all shun the village below the chateau, in which the beautiful somnambulist helplessly perpetuates her ancestral crimes. Wearing an antique bridal gown, the beautiful queen of the vampires sits all alone in her dark high house under the eyes of the portraits of her demented and atrocious ancestors, each one of whom through her projects a baleful posthumous existence. She counts out the tarot cards, ceaselessly construing a constellation of possibilities, as if the random fall of the cards on the red plush tablecloth before her could precipitate her from her chill, shuttered room into a country of perpetual summer and obliterate the perennial sadness of a girl who is both death and the maiden. Her voice is filled with distant sonorities like reverberations in a cave. Now you are at the place of annihilation. Now you are at the place of annihilation. And she is herself a cave full of echoes. She is a system of repetitions. She is a closed circuit. Can a bird sing only the song it knows? Or can it learn a new song? She draws her long, sharp fingernails across the bars of the cage, in which her pet lark sings, striking a plagiant twang like that of the plucked heartstrings of a woman of metal. Her hair falls down like tears. The castle is mostly given over to ghostly occupants, but she herself has her own suite of drawing room and bedroom. Closely barred shutters and heavy velvet curtains keep out every leak of natural light. There is a round table on a single leg covered with a red plush cloth on which she lays out her inevitable tarot. This room is never more than faintly illuminated by a heavily shaded lamp on the mantelpiece, and the dark red-figured wall peg is obscurely distressingly patterned by the rain that drives in through the neglected roof and leaves behind it random areas of staining, ominous marks, like those left on the sheets by dead lovers. Depredations of rot and fungus are everywhere. The unlit chandelier is heavy with dust, the individual prisms no longer show any shapes. Industrious spiders have woven canopies in the corners of this ornate and rotting place, having trapped the porcelain vases on the mantelpiece in soft grey nets. But the mistress of all this disintegration notices nothing. She sits in a chair covered in moth-ravaged burgundy velvet at the low round table and distributes the cards sometimes the lark sings, but more often remains a sullen mound of drab feathers. Sometimes the countess will wake it for a brief cadenza by strumming the bars of its cage. She likes to hear it announce how it cannot escape. She rises when the sun sets and goes immediately to her table where she plays her game of patience until she grows hungry, until she becomes ravenous. She is so beautiful she is unnatural. Her beauty is an abnormality, a deformity, for none of her features exhibit any of those touching imperfections that reconcile us to the imperfection of the human condition. Her beauty is a symptom of her disorder, of her soullessness. The white hands of the Trenobus bell deal the hand of destiny. Her fingers are longer than those of the mandarins of ancient China, and each is paired to a fine point. These, and teeth as fine and white as spikes of spun sugar, are the visible signs of the destiny she wistfully attempts to evade. Her claws and teeth have been sharpened on centuries of corpses. She is the last bud of the poison tree that sprang from the loins of Vlad the Impaler, who picnicked on corpses in the forests of Transylvania. A Chignon priest of the Orthodox faith staked out her wicked father at a Carpathian crossroad before her milk teeth grew. 
Just as they staked him out, the fatal count cried, Nosferatu is dead. Long live Nosferatu. Now she possesses all the haunted forests and mysterious habitations of his vast domain. She is the hereditary commandant of the Army of Shadows who camp in the village below her chateau, who penetrate the woods in the form of owls, bats, and foxes, who make the milk curdle and the butter refuse to come, who ride the horses all night on a wild hunt so they are sacks of skin and bone in the morning, who milk the cows dry and especially torment pubescent girls with fainting fits, disorders of the blood, diseases of the imagination. But the Countess herself is indifferent to her own weird authority, as if she were dreaming it. In her dream, she would like to be human, but she does not know if that is possible. The terror always shows the same configuration. Always she turns up, la papesse, la morte, la tua bolie, wisdom, death, dissolution. On moonless nights, her keeper lets her out into the garden. This garden, an exceedingly somber place, bears a strong resemblance to a burial ground, and all the roses her dead mother planted have grown up into a huge spiked wall that incarcerates her in the castle of her inheritance. When the back door opens, the countess will sniff the air and howl. She drops now on all fours, crouching, quivering. She catches the scent of her prey, delicious crunch of the fragile bones of rabbits and small furry things she pursues with fleet, four-footed speed. She will creep home, whimpering, with blood smeared on her cheeks. She pours water from the urn her bedroom into the bowl. She washes her face with the wincing, fastidious gestures of a cat. An old mute looks after her to make sure she never sees the sun, that all day she stays in her coffin, to keep mirrors and all reflective surfaces away from her. In short, to perform all the functions of the servants of vampires. Everything about this beautiful and ghastly lady is as it should be, queen of night, queen of terror, except her horrible reluctance for the role. Nevertheless, if an unwise adventurer pauses in the square of the deserted village to refresh himself at the fountain, a crone in a black dress and white apron presently emerges from a house. She will invite you with smiles and gestures. You will follow her. The Countess wants fresh meat. And it is the same with the shepherd boys and gypsy lads who, ignorant or foolhardy, come to wash the dust from their feet in the water of the fountain. The Countess's governess brings them into the drawing room, where the cards on the table always show the grim reaper. The Countess herself will serve them coffee in tiny craft precious cups and little sugar cakes. The hobbled ahoys sit with a spilling cup in one hand and a biscuit in the other, gaping at the Countess in her satin finery as she pours from a silver pot and chatters distractedly to put them at their fatal ease. A certain desolate stillness of her eyes indicates that she is inconsolable. She would like to caress their lean brown cheeks and stroke their ragged hair. When she takes them by the hand and leads them into her bedroom, they can scarcely believe their luck. Afterwards, the governess will tidy the remains into a neat pile and wrap it in its own discarded clothes. This mortal parcel she then discreetly buries in the garden. The blood on the countess's cheeks will be mixed with tears. Her keeper probes her fingernails for her with a little silver toothpick to get rid of the fragments of skin and bone that have lodged there. Fee, fi, fo, fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman. One hot, ripe summer in the pubescent years of the present century, a young officer in the British Army, blonde, blue-eyed, heavy-muscled, Visiting friends in Vienna, 
decided to spend the remainder of his furlough exploring the little-known uplands of Romania. When he decided to travel the rutted cart tracks by bicycle, he saw all the humor of it, on two wheels in the land of the vampires. So, laughing, he sets out on his adventure. He has the special quality of virginity, most and least ambiguous of states, ignorance, yet at the same time power and potential. He is more than he knows, and has about him besides the special glamour of that generation for whom history has already prepared a special exemplary fate in the trenches of France. Being rooted in change and time is about to collide with the timeless Gothic eternity of the vampires, for whom all is as it always has been and will be, whose cards always fall in the same pattern. Although so young, he is also rational. He has chosen the most rational mode of transportation in the world for his trip around the Carpathians. To ride a bicycle is in itself some protection against superstitious fears, since the bicycle is the product of pure reason applied to motion. A single kiss woke up the sleeping beauty in the wood. The waxen figures of the Countess turn up the card called La Marat. Never, never before, never before has the Countess cast herself a fate involving love. She shakes, she trembles, her great eyes close beneath her finely veined, nervously fluttering eyelids. For the first time, she has dealt herself a hand of love and death. Be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. At the mauvish beginnings of the evening, the English monsieur toils up the hill to the village he glimpsed from a great way off. He must dismount and push his bicycle before him, the path too steep for it to ride. He hopes to find a friendly inn to rest at night. He's hot, hungry, thirsty, weary, and dusty. And the fountain where the village women used to wash their clothes still gushed out bright, clear water. He gratefully washed his feet and hands, applied his mouth to the faucet, then let the icy stream run over his face. When he raised his dripping, gratified head from the lion's mouth, he saw silently arriving beside him in the square an old woman who smiled eagerly at him. She wore a black dress and a white gown with a housekeeper's key ring at the waist. She bobbed a curtsy at the young man and beckoned him to follow her. When he hesitated, she pointed towards the great bulk of the mansion above them, whose facade lord over the village rubbed her stomach, pointed to her mouth, rubbed her stomach again, clearly miming an invitation to supper. Then she beckoned him again, this time turning determinedly upon her heel as though she would brook no opposition. A great intoxicated surge of the heavy scent of red roses blew into his face as soon as they left the village, inducing a sensuous vertigo, a blast of rich, faintly corrupt sweetness strong enough almost to fell him. Too many roses. Too many roses bloomed on enormous thickets that lined the path, thickets bristling with thorns, and the flowers themselves were almost too luxuriant. There are huge congregations of plush petals, somehow obscene in their excess, their whorled, tightly budded cores outrageous in their implications. The mansion emerged grudgingly out of this jungle. But in for a penny, in for a pound, in this youth and strength and blonde beauty, in the invisible, even acknowledged pentacle of his virginity, the young man stepped over the threshold of Nosferatu's castle and did not shiver in the blast of cold air as from the mouth of a grave that emanated from the light cavernous interior. The crone took him to a little chamber where there was a black oak table spread with a clean white cloth and this cloth was carefully laid with heavy silverware, a little tarnished, as if someone with foul breath had breathed on it, but laid with one place only, curiouser and curiouser, invited to the castle for dinner. Now he must dine alone. 
The crone bustled about to get him a bottle of wine and a glass from an ancient cabinet of warmy oak. While he bemusedly drank his wine, she disappeared but soon returned bearing a steaming platter of the local spiced meat stew with dumplings and a shank of black bread. He was hungry after his long day's ride. He ate heartily and polished his plate with the crust, but this coarse food was hardly the entertainment he expected from the gentry, and he was puzzled by the assessing glint in the dumb woman's eyes as she watched him eating. When he was finished, the old woman came and gestured he should leave the table and follow her at once. She made a pantomime of drinking. He deduced he was now to be invited to take after-dinner coffee in another room with some more elevated member of the household who had not wished to dine with him, but all the same wanted to make his acquaintance. An honor, no doubt. In deference to his host's opinion of himself, he straightened his tie, brushed the crumbs from his tweed jacket. He was surprised to find how ruinous the interior of the house was. Cobwebs, worm-eaten beams, crumbling plaster. But the mute crone resolutely wound him on the reel of her lantern down endless corridors, up winding staircases, through the galleries where the painted eyes of family portraits briefly flickered as they passed. Eyes that belonged, he noticed, to faces one and all of a quite memorable beastliness. At last she paused and rapped with her knuckles on the panels. The most seductively caressing voice he had ever heard in his life softly called out in heavily accented French the adopted language of the Romanian aristocracy. Entree. First of all he saw only a shape, a shape imbued with a faint luminosity since it caught and reflected in its yellowed surfaces what little light there was in the ill-lit rooms. The countess stood behind a low table, beside a pretty gilt birdcage, hands outstretched in a distracted attitude that was almost one of flight. Her huge dark eyes almost broke his heart, with their waif-like lost look. Yet he was disturbed, almost repelled by her extraordinarily fleshy mouth, a mouth with wide, full, prominent lips of a vibrant purplish crimson, a morbid mouth. Even, but he put the thought away from him immediately, a whore's mouth. Coffee, she said, you must have coffee, and scooped up her cards into a pile so the crone could set her silver spirit kettle, silver coffee pot and cups on a silver tray. A strange touch of elegance in this devastated interior. Welcome to my chateau. I rarely receive visitors, and that's a misfortune since nothing animates me half as much as the presence of a stranger. She offered him a sugar biscuit, her voice issuing from those red lips like the obese roses in her garden. And the light, I must apologize for the lack of the light, a hereditary affliction of the eyes. If he presented himself to her naked face, he would dazzle her like the sun she is forbidden to look at, because it would shrivel her up at once. Poor night bird, poor butcher bird. You have such a fine throat, monsieur, like a column of marble. I do not mean to hurt you. I shall wait for you in my bride's dress in the dark. The bridegroom has come. He will go into the chamber which has been prepared for him. I will be very gentle. It will all be over very quickly. You will feel no pain, my darling. And could love free me from the shadows? Can a bird sing only the song it knows? Or can it learn a new song? To conceal her inner voices, she keeps up a nervous chatter in French, while her ancestors leer and grimace on the walls. He was struck once again with a sense of strangeness that had been growing on him since he buried his head under the streaming water in the village. Had he been a cat, he would have bounced backwards from her hands on four fear-stiffened legs. But he is not a cat. He is a hero. 
He will learn to shudder in the trenches, but this girl will not make him shudder. Her chatter comes trickling and diminishing to a stop. I'll shriek. Now you are at the place of annihilation. Now you are at the place of annihilation. She has not eaten for three days. It is dinner time. It is bedtime. The raven calls on the accursed roof. Dinner time! Dinner time! clang the portraits on the walls. A ghastly hunger gnaws her entrails. She has waited for him all her life without knowing it. The handsome bicyclist scarcely believes his luck. He will follow her into her bedroom. She will assure him in a voice of temptation. My clothes have but to fall and you will see before you a succession of mysteries. She will croon the lullaby of the house of Nosferatu. Tomorrow her keeper will bury his bones under her roses. The food that gives them their rich color, their swooning order that breathes of forbidden pleasures. Fearful for his hostess's health, her sanity, he follows her. What a macabre bedroom. How can she bear the pain of becoming human? The end of exile is the end of being. He is awakened by lark song. The candles are burnt out, and she must have set her pet lark free, for it is perched on the edge to sing him a song. His bones are stiff. He had slept on the floor with his bundled-up jacket after he put her to bed. He got to his feet and coaxed the lark to his wrist. First it was reluctant, but he tossed it to the air, and it spread its wings and was up and away to the clear blue heavens. He watched its trajectory with a lift of joy in his heart. The heavy curtains are pulled back to let the brilliant morning light. She is not sleeping. In death she looked far older, less beautiful, and so, for the first time, fully human. I will vanish in the morning light. I will leave you as a souvenir the fanged rose I plucked from between my thighs, like the flower laid on a grave, on a grave. My keeper will attend to everything. After a search in some foul-smelling outhouses, he discovered his bicycle and, abandoning his holiday, rode directly to Bucharest, where at the post he found a telegram summoning him to rejoin his regiment at once. Much later, when he changed back into uniform in his quarters, he discovered he still had the Countess's rose. He must have tucked it into his breast pocket after he found her body. Curiously, although, he had brought it so far away from Romania, the flower did not seem to be quite dead. And on impulse, because the girl had been so lovely, and her death so unexpected and pathetic. He decided to try and resurrect her rose. He filled his tooth glass with water from the carafe from his locker and popped the rose in it so its withered head floated on the surface. When he returned from the mess that evening, the heavy fragrance of Count Nosferatu's roses drifted down the stone corridor of the barracks to greet him and his Spartan quarters brimmed with the reeling odor of a glowing, velvet, monstrous flower whose petals had regained all their former bloom and elasticity, their corrupt, brilliant, baleful splendor. The next day, his regiment embarked for France.